Mark is amazing. Mark Rose is from Vancouver. He is a human connection specialist. He's the founder of the Masters of the Universe Summit and expert at human relationships and knowing yourself. His Create the Love Instagram feed has a cult following. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Groves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Woo! All right, so when I actually first titled this talk, I called it How to Make Your Life Feel Like an Orgasm. And I realized that that was probably both politically incorrect and a bit of an overpromise, because if we have them all the time, they would cease to be as special, right? Right? So I wanted to call it how to make your, your whole life awesome, because I think we tend to compartmentalize things. Like we're really good at business, we sort of like ignore the relationship side of things, and if we're, relationships are really thriving, often that's where we, so we sort of like go where we're celebrated. And I think when we're talking about business and life and mindfulness, we always get into this subject of work-life balance, right? We hear that all the time. I used to work at this company where they would, for 14 years, they would always have new work-life balance initiatives. And what's fascinating is, like, I was just listening to Jeff Bezos speak a week ago, and he was saying that really, like, the, the metaphor of work-life balance gives us this idea that there's a trade-off. That, you know, if, if your business is going to do well, your, your family suffers, and if your, your personal life is doing well, then you're sort of missing out or not paying attention to your work. And I really like that thought that it's more like work-life synergy. And it's like, where are you getting your energy from? And are you getting your energy from every area of your life? Because if you're really in purpose at work and you're doing a really good job, you know, maybe um, really contributing to the team, then you're going to bring that person to your home. Just like if your relationships are thriving, you're going to bring that to your work, and it completely changes things. And so I really think that it's just life, and then there's everything that we put into life. And you know, it, maybe the question then becomes, like, in, including our business, what is the way that we create a really great life? And so I thought maybe the best thing to do is to ask people who are about to die what's most important. Don't worry, this gets more more uh, alivened. So the top five regrets of the dying, has anyone heard of this by Bronnie Ware? So she's a palliative care nurse who um, asked all the people who were passing away, you know, what, what is it that they regretted most? And the number one thing was, I wish I had the courage to live a life to myself, true to myself, not to the expectations, um, uh, the, the life others expected of me. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. This is like the classic entrepreneur's thing, right? Boundaries, 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 boundaries. And if you have bad boundaries before you became an entrepreneur or before you entered a relationship, it will get extremely magnified when you enter either of those worlds. The third one, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. And number four, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. And number five, I wish I'd had let myself be happier. I mean, all of these really come down to our relationships with ourselves, of course. And, if, and our relationships to other people and express really like a couple of those are about authenticity and expression and also balancing our lives but having boundaries. I remember saying to my girlfriend, when I started my own business, I didn't actually expect to work more than when I worked for someone else's business. And she said, well, you have to stop saying yes to everything. And I thought, that's so simple, but still so challenging. And so that's why I really like started to get very fascinated about my relationship and fear of disappointing others with the word no. And then you realize that everyone's actually just fine when you say no. So a little bit of a discovery. So my argument to you is that life is really about relationships. I don't have the research to support this statement, but I believe that we probably drink more coffee and wine on the subject of relationships and the recovering from than anything else. I mean, people are obsessed with the subject, and the beautiful thing is that when it comes to the skill set of communication and relating to others, it's really the content that determines the context. The skill set is similar no matter what. So I'm going to bring you through a little exploration of what is it that gets in the way of building really great relationships as a leader, as a partner, as a relationship partner in romance, and also within teamwork and stuff. And then how do we actually create deepening, better relationships? So this is a quote from John Gottman. Sorry, I'm in your way. This is a quote from John Gottman, who's like the godfather of relationship research. The thing that all really good marriages and love relationships have in common is that they communicate to their partner a model that when you're upset, I listen. The world stops, and I listen. And we repair things. 
We don't let things go. We don't leave one another in pain. We talk about it and we repair. And what I love about this is imagine if you just removed the love and romantic relationship aspect of that and you just made that about being a leader, being a teammate. But even in the, in the case of um, how you're going to respond to other people. I, I was in sales for 14 years and I know that whenever there was an objection it was like the, the world literally did have to stop and I had to take care of it and pay attention and that's what develops amazing relationships, that's what builds trust. We know that in the science of what creates a secure relationship, which is what we are ultimately all after, it's that our partner's needs matter as much as our own. But that's so true within any form of business too. So I love this quote. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about his research. So essentially what we're talking about is relational awareness. So we're talking, and relational awareness is really like, what's my stuff? Like what composes my stuff? Where does my stuff come from? And then how does my stuff play with your stuff? Which actually sounds a little dirty, but how does my stuff play with your stuff? And that creates our stuff. And that is true of no matter what relationship you're part of. You will always be relating to different people and their own background, their own lens, their own experience. And of course in relationships in work or home, all decisions are really emotional. Especially in selling something, everything is emotionally based. People buy something because they experience dissonance if they don't. So I love this painting by Laura Banz and Martin because I think it really communicates exactly what is true for all of us, which is we are on this earth to connect. We are wired to connect to each other neurobiologically. And, and no matter the type of relationship, high conflict in relationships really affects us. And so they did this study where they gave people a little cut on their arm and then they measured the level of hostility in their relationships. And they saw that people in extremely hostile relationships actually healed slower. And John Gottman, the guy I was alluding to before, he would observe couples who were seemingly fine just talking and, and they're not fighting. But if their relationship had high levels of conflict, their body was responding like it was beside a tiger. Isn't that crazy? So our bodies are really you know, evolutionary and advanced, they're really beautiful, they're wonderful, but we don't really know the difference between a stressful job, a stressful life, a stressful relationship, and a tiger. You know, so imagine if just you know, a, high, a challenging relationship affects how we heal a wound on our arm. What does it do when we're trying to fight things like heart disease or cancer? So if challenging relationships can in some ways hurt us, can really beautiful, amazing relationships help us? The answer is yes. In the longest running study on happiness, it's called the Harvard Men's Study. It now includes women, right? About time. They, um, they studied Harvard graduates and compared them to kids who grew up in the poor neighborhoods of Boston. And they saw that your health at 80 was not predictive by your blood pressure or your cholesterol or where you came from. It was predicted by the quality of your relationships at 50. Isn't that crazy? And it wasn't just romantic relationships, it was relationships of all kinds. Because how we relate to any human being, our ability to communicate effectively will be the single greatest predictor of success in every, any area of our lives, especially being able to build a mindful business, being able to build an amazing life. And you know, when we relate to other people and the outcomes that we have with relationships of all types, we're really seeing a mirror of what we're good at and especially the things we're not so good at. Remember my dad said to me when I was a kid, he was like, very few people are actually able to do an accurate emotional audit of the things they're not so good at. Of course the humans were like, like I'm really good at hearing what is the positive traits of a Scorpio. But as soon as someone's like, and they're also bullheaded, and I'm like, nah, not that part. So really it, it forces us to understand how we relate to other people. It really makes us look, you know, if we look at the outcomes we have in all forms of relationship, it's really a, a good sign of what we need to work on. And you know, where we learn our relationship communication is really from our families. You know, unless we've sought outside education, which probably most of the people in this room have, but if we haven't actually sought out you know, information on how to turn any form of conflict into intimacy or connection, how would we know how? You know? And so when you actually think of, if you just look up five generations and you assume no divorce in your family, you have 30 people's stuff, you know, just like funneling down into you. And you think about anyone you're in a relationship to, it's the same thing. We learn what does communication mean to us in our family or even in the culture or society that we live in. What is conflict for us? Did we talk about things? Did we not? 
Do we turn away and get quiet when things got challenging? So I want to show you a bit of the research that's super powerful, and you might have heard of some of it. So John Gottman, him and his wife have this uh, thing they call the Love Lab in Seattle, and they would take newlyweds, and they do this with like all different you know, lengths of marriages and all those things, but they would take newlyweds, and they'd put them over this lake, and then they'd record their conversations. Right, so you just got married, we're gonna record everything you say. And they saw that just by listening to the language that people use, that they could predict divorce quite accurately. And you might know some of this data from Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. So he saw that if you were below five positive interactions to every one negative, divorced, divorced. And if you were at above five to one, relational, you know, you stayed together. You know, you were together, I can't, guarantee you were thriving, but they really saw that about seven, eight to one is where relationships were really thriving. And, th and there was a point when you could get too far. At 13 to one, it actually started to become inauthentic, you know, in that sort of Pollyanna experience where we just don't believe them anymore because they're just too positive. And you're like, have something bad happen to you. You're so boring. So, I mean, don't actually wish that upon someone. But the other part was, if he listened to 20 hours of recorded conversation, he could predict with 94% accuracy if they divorced. Like, that shows you how powerful our words are. Now, even to make that more crazy, if he listens to three minutes of a conversation, he could predict with 80% accuracy. Like, that is, that is crazy. Are you guys in awe here? Like, that's insane. So three minutes of our lives can predict our future. And so the four things he saw, he calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse, so not like a light thing, but we all do these things. So when I first read these, I was like, shit, I've done that. Should have done that, should have done that, we're screwed. But it's like, once you start learning about it, you can see when it shows up, and I'll give you the antidotes to each one too. So criticism, we all know this one, starts usually with you always, you never, right? We don't like to give a little space where they might not have done it a couple times. We're like, you always. And now that one is followed up by contempt. So contempt is things like eye rolling. Eye rolling is the greatest predictive behavior of divorce. Isn't that crazy? I've actually presented that and seen someone be like, fuck, whatever. <laughs> I'm like, like, you guys are gonna do well. Um, and so it's also a hierarchical thing. So it sarcasm can be used in that way. There might be a lot of disgust, like a face of disgust when the partner is speaking. The next one is defensiveness. This usually is part of the dance of criticism. So we feel criticized, we get defensive, and really defensiveness is about protecting our core. Now I want you to understand that all of these things you're going to see as triggers and responses in the business too. He's done research in business, but we all know this. We've all functioned in teams. We've all managed people who are being managed, and we know that there's usually something that gets triggered in us, and we all go to the same parts. We just tend to have a little more willpower at work where we don't totally explode because we know our, our business future is in, in jeopardy. So the last one is stonewalling. And stonewalling is when you withdraw, you shut down, you leave, and, and you become unavailable. So the, the antidote to criticism is to try to start your sentences, your conversations with, I feel, or I think, and you start to own it. Then it takes it off of them. It's less likely. Now, if, if you've been in a dance of defensiveness criticism, it's, it takes a bit to unlearn that dance, to be like, you're not doing what you used to do, and we used to do this thing. And so we just have to learn each other a little better. Contempt usually requires some sort of outside therapy or coaching in order to actually restructure the relationship so it's equal. I mean, stopping rolling of the eyes is a great tip, um, and to actually give our partner space to hear them. Defensiveness. Now, I'm a recovering defensiveness, and I've, I've got to tell you, it's a skill that I have now developed where I can feel it go, but I don't do it anymore. And the antidote to this one was painful. Oh. It was like every time we, I would get defensive, I had to stop and I had to say, I can see some truth in that. And I was like, ugh. <laughs> but I mean, the beautiful part is I had to start owning my part in everything and all stories are co-created. So know that no matter what, you're still part of the dance. And so part of it is just taking responsibility. The last one, stonewalling, ideally it would be that we stay, right? That when we're feeling flooded in any form of argument or conversation or conflict, that we would stay. Now that's the hope. Now the first part is the challenge of, that can be really overwhelming, especially if we have experiences around that that have been painful. So it's learning how to stay a little longer than is comfortable, to be vulnerable in that space. It's also learning to communicate with whoever we're in that with to say, hey, I just need like 15, 30 minutes to calm down or to chill out and think about this, or two hours or whatever it is. 
the most important part is that you're the one who returns at the agreed upon time. Because usually the space we put to anyone causes anxiety for the person who experiences the space. So we're building trust. Like, I trust that when you ask for space, you're going to come back. And then that starts to be built, and you start to be able to stay a little longer. So this is a real simple way to give feedback at work. This is obviously a very, I have 20 minutes to walk through all of this. So it's, this is a very simplistic way to structure any feedback. And it's in situation X, when you do Y, I feel Z. So it's a very simple way to do it in a non-triggering way that really simplifies language and makes us a better communicator almost instantly. So anyone here familiar with the five love languages? Right? It's fantastic when we learn about this. And then they have the quiz online that is free to do. You could, it takes 10 minutes. And what was really fascinating, so these are the five love languages. So quality time, acts of service, words of affirmation, physical touch, and gifts. And so I was working with this couple where the guy was saying, or the, the woman was saying, you never, I don't feel like you really show your love to me. Like I feel like we're, you, know, you just don't show it to me and I don't feel very loved by you. And he's like, I pick you up every day. I make you lunch. He's like, I couldn't love you more. And when they did this test, hers was words of affirmation. And she realized that he just wasn't telling her. And he's like, well, what about all the other stuff? She's like, still do those things. <laughs> but I, when I asked my girlfriend, I was like, what's your love language? She's like, all of them. I'm like, well, that's either very simple or very complex. So in the workplace, this is brilliant to do. Because you start to see that where we thought we had to monetarily bonus people or something like that, we actually start to see that just telling them they're doing a really good job or just doing something nice for them, which is an act of service. Physical touch, I'd be careful with that one. But like you're doing so good. That's a massage, by the way, just in case you weren't sure. So um, the last part that I wanted to just touch base on is willpower. So the science of willpower is really actually quite fascinating. It shows that when we wake up in the morning, you know, assuming we have a reasonable sleep, we have a full tank of gas, in a sense, like a full tank of willpower. And over the day, like I was saying to you before, we sort of like limit our emotional responses at work, right? So we sort of like get depleted throughout the day. And then when we get home, or assuming our day is structured more like that, it would be like after an exhaustive experience, we get home and people want to talk. But we actually need time in order to restore ourselves. Food does it, sleep does it. Sugar, that's why we crave sugar in stressful situations, because it goes to our mind really quickly to use the sugar. But in the research, they showed that they looked at crimes, that were, and they normalized them, so we were comparing similar crimes. And it was people going for parole. And they saw that if you saw the judge before 10.30, your approval rate was like above 60%. But as soon as you actually went closer to lunch, the approval rate went down around 40%, to a 40%, 30-something. And so then they saw it go back up at 1 p.m. So if any of you have court dates coming up, this is a really good thing. So they, at 1 p.m., they saw it go back up to the 60s and then back down towards the end of the day. So it really shows like our ability to process information. And, and that's why we want to have the most difficult conversations when we're feeling rested. And that can be hard, because often the difficult conversations feel very urgent. But they might not be as productive and resolved. You know, in the research, even in the research on teams and leaders, we see, and there's obviously tons of research going into empathetic leadership and all those types of things, but it's shown that in the research on relationships, the two most valuable qualities in the end of the day are always kindness and generosity. Always. And that obviously makes sense in any capacity of life. So I want to bring it back. This is a, a sculpture from Burning Man 2015. It's by Alexander Milov. And you can see it's two adults with their backs turned and they're shut down. But inside them is this child, this child that's saying, I want connection. I need safety. I need love. Now, what I, I love this because it's all of us. It's such a beautiful depiction of all of us. And when we think about building a mindful business and not losing a mind, when we think about the five regrets of the dying that I touched on at the beginning, life is all about self-expression. And that's why I'm sure mo I mean, think of everyone in here as an entrepreneur. That's what our work is. Our work is self-expression. And really, the work we need to do as we work through all of this and in relationship is to learn how to give a voice to ourselves, is to learn how to honor the child inside of us and actually give birth to, their, to the words that we need to speak, because that's what creates connection. Really, ultimately, a joyful life is because all aspects of it are amazing. And we don't have to like settle in any section. We shouldn't have to. So with that, I leave you. Thank you.